This is not going to be a long video, folks. I'm just hoping that some climate change experts can help me clear up this one. The Maldives is a small nation in the Indian Ocean made up of hundreds of small atolls. Over 80% of the land area of this archipelago nation is just one meter above the mean sea level, leaving it particularly at risk uh, if the sea level was ever to rise. Scientists have been giving grave warnings about the Maldives for many years. In 1988, they predicted that it may be submerged in 30 years time. Remarkably, in 2018, after this prediction had not come to pass, scientists again predicted that the Maldives could become uninhabitable in 30 years, which was naturally repeated again and again by the media. The Guardian, just last year, told us that mass migration from the islands is going to have to start sooner rather than later. In fact, this narrative is so well-worn that it has even made it onto the GCSE science syllabus. For non-British viewers, that's a core curriculum exam taken by all 16-year-olds in this country. Now, there are some confusing aspects to this. For starters, in 2015, in The New Scientist, some experts walked back the claim and said that the atolls may actually grow in the coming years. Two years later, in the same publication, they went back to the original claim that the Maldives was under grave threat. In 2018, Fizz.org repeated the claim that climate change may actually help to grow the atolls. So it's really hard to get a clear answer on this. Are the islands going to shrink or are they going to grow? Well, in any case, in 2008, the new president, Mohamed Nasheed, who was a human rights activist, pledged to buy a new homeland for his people, for when they inevitably had to flee the incoming disaster. More about him in a moment. Now, you know me, dear viewer. I am interested in economics and in revealed preferences. I do not care what people say, I care about what they actually do. Given this impending doom, I doubt insurance companies would be willing to operate in the Maldives. And if you were an investor or a building developer, for example, these islands would surely not represent any value because, well, who is going to sign a leasehold mortgage with only 30 years on it? and on an extortionate insurance premium that most companies would not touch with a barge pole. Given the stone-cold facts of climate change, so undoubtable that they are enshrined on the GCSE syllabus, and on which an elected president pledged to take extreme action, one would also expect to see people gradually move away from the Maldives. The risks are surely too great. So what does the data tell us on this front? Oh, there's been a 50% increase in the population of the Maldives since 2002. Now that seems very strange in an environment in which we'd expect to see capital flight from the area, you know, owing to the aforementioned impending doom. But wait, foreign direct investment in the Maldives has more than quadrupled since the year 2000. This is very strange behavior from people betting with their own money. Don't they know that their money will be under the sea before long? But things get even weirder. In 2018, the state started construction on a brand new runway for their international airport. This is going to cost $400 million. On a side note, it appears that the Chinese may be fleecing the Maldives, having raised their prices after contracts were already signed, but the behaviour of Chinese contractors around the world is another story entirely. Now, given that the Maldives may be under the sea by the year 2030, this expenditure seems extraordinarily wasteful. I can't really make head nor tail of it. What happened to the plan of buying a new homeland? How is encouraging more planes to come to the Maldives going to help the climate change issue? This isn't the only big infrastructure spending project either. The Housing Development Corporation are building 
240,000 new homes on a reclaimed island, and this is set to be completed in the next decade. The project cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Considering these new homes could be underwater by the year 2030, this is baffling. Another strange fact is that over the past 20 years, as these warnings have become more dire, the Maldives has consistently had positive net migration. Why aren't people fleeing? Even more strange is that what I can make out, uh, the insurance market in the Maldives is on the up and up. Why are insurance companies taking on such massive risk? Remember, due to the impending floods, people are going to have to move out sooner rather than later. Surely the market should have adjusted to this new reality by now. It's really weird. It's like none of the locals, none of the businessmen, and even not even the government of the Maldives are really taking this extremely urgent issue that seriously. I mean, it's their own lives, it's their own money. In fact, they've been quite explicit about this, not only in their revealed preferences, but also in their stated preferences. So whatever happened to our old friend Mohammed Nasheed? He was the man with the plan, don't forget, to relocate the people of the Maldives to a new homeland. Back in 2009, he said that if that plan fails, we are all going to die. Well, it turns out he resigned in 2012 after mass demonstrations and was jailed for 13 years on terror charges. He fled to London in exile, lamenting the fact that the Maldives has done a U-turn on climate change policy. Quite interesting. Now, I found a long, politically correct Euro Money article about this, which I'll link in the notes. It makes for quite interesting reading. But my question for the experts is this. It is one thing to talk about changing government policy, but quite another to suggest that investors and business people would bet with their own money in the face of such extraordinary risks. Why do insurance companies continue to operate in the Maldives? Why are people moving to the Maldives rather than from it? Why would anyone build anything in a place that is set to be underwater in 30 years? Answers on a postcard, please. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Stetson F. Lionel, The Ambivalent Onion, Christopher Scholholm, The Crimson Satyr, Chris, Kieran Hayward, Mr. A.M. Swainson, Radical Liberation, The Binary Surfer, Tragic Vision, Bailey and Aurora, Toyotomi Ami, Holy Spatula, Alexander, Froggy, Splice, Buck Hegit Society, Michael Meir, Jay Green River, Michael Tynan, Heronius Napalm V, Vincenzo Rapio, and Edward Dara.